This is episode 72 with ultra runner Diane Van Deeren. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Running 100 miles is remarkable. Running 100 miles, winning races, and doing it as someone who's 58 and who's had part of their brain removed is a whole other thing. Diane Van Deeren is a longtime North Face athlete who actually speaks at REI's Altessa events, which is how I heard about her. She's an incredibly accomplished ultra runner who suffered from epilepsy for 10 years. In 1997, she underwent a risky and radical brain surgery where doctors removed a portion of the right side of her brain, which was the focal point of her seizures, so she could remain seizure-free forever. Diane was an athlete before the surgery, but after she started running and running more. And in many ways, although she lost some things since the surgery, like her sense of time and sometimes even her sense of direction, two things one might need in a sport like distance trail running, well, running became her medicine. A mom of three, a wife, and a recent grandma, she has incredible feats and records. She won the Yukon Arctic Ultra, a 430-mile foot race, pulling a 50-pound sled through temps below 50 for eight days. She climbed South America's tallest peak. She completed the world's hardest 100-mile race, running for 45 hours straight. She also ran and set the record for the 1,000-mile Mountain to Sea Trail, where she basically traversed the entire state of North Carolina in just over 22 days. Diane is a survivor, a peak performer, and she has an incredibly refreshing perspective on time and reaching your most true potential. Thank you again to the North Face and Altessa for introducing us. Enjoy. When did you start running long distances and why? I mean, I've always been athletic, Shelby, even at a young age. You know, I knew I had a gift. You were a pro tennis player, right? I, I did, yes. I played professional tennis for years and left high school early. And so I really loved athletics. I loved movement. I loved anything with a ball, bat, mitt, um, you know, anything that would challenge. And so I kind of had that already in my blood. But the endurance running really and truly came. I never heard of them, Shelby. I didn't even know what an endurance run was, right? And a girlfriend of mine told me about these 50-mile races, and I thought, really? Huh, okay, I'll go try one. So I ran a 50-mile race, and I won that. And then somebody said, well, you can go farther. Wait, hold on, back up. So your first 50-mile race, you won? I did, yes. And was this before your surgery or after? It was after my surgery. Okay, so after your surgery... Did you try other sports or did you first start with running? You know, I always found that the running was a way for me to cope when I had the seizures. And then after they removed that part of my brain and now I'm seizure free, running was always my outlet, kind of my medicine, the way to create a safe place for me. And, um, and so really when I ran that first 50 mile race, Shelby, I remember the jump, there was two of us that were running together. And I told this gentleman, who's still a dear friend of mine, I said, Richard, I need to share something with you. I said, I've had brain surgery. I had seizures for 10 years. I said, I'm seizure free now, but nobody knows what I've been through yet. But I just want to tell you, if something happens to me on the trail out here, I've got a pill in my back pocket. I might need you to give it to me just in case. And he and I still laugh about that because um, here he just meets me. He's an ultra runner, and he thought, okay, I'm going to show this girl what ultra running's about and help her. And here I throw this at him, and he thought, oh, my gosh, now I've got to be worried about her. But um, anyway, but the funny thing was, you know, um, I finished that, won that, and then the 100-mile race, Shelby, I, you know, there's the um, Bighorn 100. It's up in Wyoming, okay? So wait, can I, can I back up? How old were you after the surgery when you had, you did this first 50K? Uh, first 50 miler was... 50 miler. 
which is even gnarlier. No, that's okay. And dates are kind of hard for me. Um, so I could go that's back okay. to when I was 42. 42. Okay. So your first, first distance run, it's 42. You win it. And then, and then you do this hundred mile. I did. And, and the way I really got into ultra running, I trained for the Bighorn 100. And of course, you know, I was seizure free. I had brain surgery. Now it wasn't for a tumor or cancer, Shelby. It was just damaged tissue for 10 years of having uncontrollable seizures. I had epilepsy and, um, really and truly we thought it worked, but we don't know. Right. And so after I won the 50 and I heard about the 100, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Wyoming. I'm going to train for a 100-mile race. Never done one. You got to run these trails, mountains, snow, rivers, streams, big mountain climbs. I mean, horrific, right? And I remember my husband and doctors were a little bit concerned. And how's Diane going to run sleep-deprived, stressful, stressing her body? They were a little bit on edge about the 100-miler. I wasn't because I really and truly always felt the mountains was my safe spot, Shelby. And um, I just got on the starting line, had no idea what would happen, ran, 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 kept running. I think I finished that race. I think I might have even placed way back then. And um, once again, nobody knew my story. And I crossed that finish line, I don't know, 28, 29 hours later. And Shelby, I remember <sighs> when I finished that um, that hundred miler, you know, everybody was a little bit on edge, but I remember crossing that finish line and saying, all right, I finished, I finished. I proved to those doctors, I proved to everyone I could run nonstop. I could stress my body. I could be sleep to revive. And then also, you know, succeed in my first hundred mile race. And at that point I was beat up, right, girl? My feet are swollen. I'm bloody. I hit trees. I slipped. I fell. And I remember as I came home, my husband brought me home. And then I got a phone call the next day from the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado. And the executive director called me and she said, um, hey, Diane, I have a favor to ask you. I said, sure, what's that? She said, we have a camp right now going on at the YMCA up in Granby. And we have about 50 of our kids up there who have uncontrollable seizures. Would you be willing to go up there and talk to them? I said, are you kidding me? I'd love to. So I remember that next day. I'm driving up to Granby, up to the YMCA camp. And once again, I am trash, Shelby, right? Never on 100. My feet, I mean, I just look terrible. And I really thought that was my last 100-mile run. And so as I'm up there, and I'm at this epilepsy camp, and I'm talking to all these kids in this, like, little auditorium room. And we're sitting in this circle, and I'm looking at them in the eye, and I said, don't let anybody ever tell you you can't. Don't let anybody ever tell you that just because you have epilepsy, you can't do something. Because Shelby, those were things I heard from doctors for years, okay? I, I said, you can do anything you want. You can parachute, you can drive, you can swim, you can drive a tractor. I mean, whatever that is, you just have to do it differently. Maybe you have an adult with you. You can parachute and you can be tethered. But don't let anybody ever tell you you can't. And I remember as I'm looking at all these kids, a couple of the children are seizing in front of me and... It was emotional, right? And I remember talking to the kids, and then this one girl, Mandy, she looked at me and she said, Hey, Diane, you know what? I have um, CP. I can't run. I have seizures. Will you run your next 100-mile race for me? Everybody thinks I'm different. They think I'm different. They, they pick on me. They tell me I have seizures. They make fun of me. And then all these kids... Shelby, all these kids start saying, yeah, Diane, will you, tell, will you tell everybody about our story? Will you tell everybody about epilepsy? Blah, blah, blah. And these kids are just leaning into me. And I'm looking at these kids just with tears in my eyes. And um, I looked those kids in the eyes and I said, you know what? I'm going to keep running 100-mile races until we get our story on national TV. And that is a pivotal moment when I got in the car, I drove home crying, and I signed up for my next hundred, and my next hundred, and my next hundred, and that's how it went. And no other race director knew of my history until I received Female Trail Runner of the Year at the Teva Mountain Games. And that's when my story came out. That's when the Today Show and ESPN and everybody picked up my story. 
But it really and truly was the kids at that camp that gave me the gift to continue and the promise that I made to them. Well, I'll never forget that day, you know, Shelby. I mean, I remember that promise I made to those kids. And then when you see them seizing, and I'm not seizing anymore because I've had the brain surgery, there's a little bit of, oh, you know, I wish they could have what I had, right? I got my health back. But, um, yeah, that commitment that I made to them. And once again, Shelby, you know, here I'm doing all these 100-mile races, and I didn't tell the race directors my history. You know, I didn't want to be any different, right? And so then the morning of the uh, Teva Mountain Games, my husband and I were driving up when I was nominated for Female Trotter of the Year. I received a phone call from a family. I was working with their little boy who was seven years old, and he had seizures. And um, he was to be tested like I was for the brain surgery to see if he could have it. And his grandfather called me just sobbing, and this little boy died that morning of a seizure in his sleep. Oh. So that was something else... I was dealing with driving up to Vail, and then as we're in this huge, you know, auditorium for the Teva Mountain Games, and I just felt honored that I was just a, being nominated for Female Trotter of the Year, right? Nobody knew my story yet, right? Nobody knew. It was my secret. I wanted to prove I was an athlete. I could do all these things before I could tell my vulnerability. And then when they announced my name as Female Trotter of the Year, Diane Van Deren, da-da-da-da, that is when I knew I proved I could be a pro athlete, I could win, I could compete, and now I can tell my story. Well, your story's really, really powerful, and it's affected a lot of people. So I'm just curious, you know, when you had your surgery, did it affect anything else besides your perception of time? You know, and that's something, Shelby, I think... Here's how it um, affected my perception of time. Um, and I, the way I explain it is I was a professional tennis player, you know, before I was diagnosed with epilepsy, had seizures for 10 years, and then they ended up moving that part of my brain because none of the medications worked, right? So I already knew as a pro athlete, I could get into the zone. You've heard of getting into the zone. You've heard about flow. That was something I always could do when I was training, when I was competing. I could just like check out and just you know, I just got blinders on. So when they talk about, you know, I lose track with time and that truly kind of got mixed up. And um, the reason for that is I, I have the ability to be so present, whether I'm running, speaking, um, writing a song, I mean, whatever that is. Um, so I lose track of time because I can be present and not be worried about what time it is, how long I've been going, what, what, you know, I don't get mixed up in the details. So for me, perception of time is really just being present and being in the moment, right? Did you used to get mixed up in the details before the surgery? You seem like you probably always were highly tuned to being a present person. Well, I do. I think I was because I was such an athlete beforehand and had all the ability to focus and overcome and train and push my body. And I mean, I, I had that kind of already in my back pocket, Shelby. And then when I was diagnosed with epilepsy, you know, I never gave up for 10 years. I never was going to give up. I wanted to find a solution to beat this terrible disorder. And then when all the, none of the medications were working for me, that's when I opted for brain surgery. But I really think I had, you know, as a pro athlete, we're different, right? I mean, I was already different before the seizures occurred. And, um, you know, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that they removed part of my right temporal lobe. That's where my seizures stem from. That's what they removed from my brain. My last seizure was the night before my surgery. Mm. So there's going to be a consequence, right? I mean, nobody's going to take out a part of a brain. And so, but those are things that I learned. And, you know, I get distracted easily. I get lost on trails because it's hard for me to hold things visually. I think the thing for me is I can't absorb a lot of information in my brain. So the more simpler my life is, the more less detailed, the better wife, the better mom, the better athlete I am. So um, those were tools I really had to learn. But yeah, I had, I had, you know, I'm grateful that I kind of had that push through power, don't give up, I'm going to prove, you know, that attitude before um, I was diagnosed with the epilepsy. So what are some things you do 
to keep your life simpler and to keep you focused. Like I know one of the things you do is you, you have sticky notes to remind yourself of things that you put on places. I do, you know, a lot for me, it's just rather than me trying to remember, you know, what I'm doing for the day or where the kids are, or my son's wife just had a baby, you know, just, I can just write notes to me rather than me trying to remember it because it gives me something to see visually because, you know, I do have some memory problems. Absolutely. So the way that I can address that is, and making it easier for me and making it less fatiguing for me mentally is just write it down, Di. Then you have it written down in front of you. You have notes. So see, and somebody with a a brain injury, you know, so I've had a part of my right temporal lobe removed. Yes, I'm seizure free. I can run the most enduring events in the world, but mental fatigue with a brain injury really will affect my performance. So the easier I make my day, the simpler, make notes. I mean, whatever that is, Shelby, then I'm going to have a better outcome. It's kind of a hidden disability, but how do I work with it? And that's what I've learned. Yeah, you've really worked with it to your advantage. So when I was watching that video, it said you'll run for hours and forget, you know, of like a 29-hour run, maybe you'll forget eight or nine of those hours. You know, what has that taught you about how much mental endurance sports are versus being physical? Oh, way more mental. And when they say I forget, I mean, you know, I... It's not like, oh my gosh, have I been running for a day or two? It's more of, um, and once again, it's just, I'm able to be present, right, Chilb? I can just like, it doesn't really matter. I mean, here, when I do a hundred mile race, does it really matter if I keep looking at my watch, what time it is, what my pace is, where I'm going, what I'm doing, where I am, where my competitors are? I mean, that's a lot of information, right? If I can just go out, start my watch and just run, and I'm giving it my all, I'm being present, I'm focusing on myself, that's pretty much, it's simple, but that's pretty much how I look at, you know, all my racing and always had. And so, sure, if I'm out there for two, three, four days or doing a big expedition or a big run, yeah, I might get lost on, okay, how many days, where have we been? But would that be an advantage? No, not really to be a disadvantage. <laughs> Because, yeah. um, you know, I'm working really hard to stay on the trail. I mean, there's other things that I'm really working on with my impairments to be successful. How old are you now, Diane? Can I ask? I know it's not typically a question we ask other women, but... No, that's no problem. I'm 58. You're 58. That's incredibly... <laughs> 58, yeah. I've been a North Face endurance athlete, been, you know, professional athlete with North Face now for 16 years and... You know, Shelby, I feel grateful. I mean, I get to race all over the world. I get to create expeditions. I get to create ideas. And North Face can back me up if I have an idea of something I want to do that nobody's ever done. And then I get to speak about them. And then um, I get to train. You know, this morning I was training at 430 in the mountains. So I've always said I'm just getting warmed up, you know, 16 years, but I think I'm just getting warmed up, Shelby. Um, I love what I do, but my running's been a great platform, right? To talk about what I've overcome and what I've done. So you're 58 and you are missing part of your brain and you are kicking everybody else's butt on the trail. I love it. I want to hear, you know, how do you choose these ideas that you present to the North Face and others? Like what's, what's maybe one, I know you're recently in Peru, was that an idea that just came to you or did someone come to you with that idea? No. Uh, so at North Face, what we have, we have the North Face Endurance Challenge. And so we have these races, um, not only here in the United States, we have different venues here. And then we have them in you know, South America. We have them in Europe. We have them all over the world, Asia. And so with me being the on the global team, which I have been for years, then I'll go to our North Face Endurance Challenge race, wherever it is. And they're like a 50 mile, a you know, 26 mile, we have a 10 miler, and then we have a kids run. We kind of have a mixture of all these different races, but it's all trail, it's all marked, it's all aid stationed. And, and so that gives me an opportunity to go to these races, speak about the event, and then, you know, what North Face is doing and about the course, and then I can go out there and then run. So I get to speak, you know, and encourage questions, and then I also get to run the event. So that's one of the venues with North Face. I already have places I can go, right? And then we also have the incredible opportunities, you know, as athletes that, for example, 
well, I, I ran a thousand miles. I ran the Mountain to Sea Trail. It's a thousand mile trail. It's from Clingman's Dome. It's from the highest point on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains. And it's a thousand mile trail, Shelby, all the way to the Outer Banks, to the highest sand dune in the country called Jockey Ridge. And I thought I was out in uh, North Carolina actually speaking um, for a company, a great outdoor provision company. They collaborated with North Face. And so when I was doing my speaking series, I'm speaking at this auditorium and then all the money that was collected on tickets went to this Mount to Sea Trail. So as a director came up and thanked me for raising funds for this trail, I said, well, what is this trail? She started telling me about it and how all the Appalachian Trail, Colorado Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, all these other trails get all this recognition and they get overshadowed. And so see Shelby right there, I'm like, huh, 1,000 miles? Well, tell me about it. Anybody ever run it? Anybody ever done it? So we started this conversation and she said, well, one guy ran it. He's a well-known ultra runner. He did it in, I don't know, 25 days. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let me see if I think I could run it. Maybe I'll run it. I'll gain you attention. I'll get you, you know, national attention for your trail. I'll collaborate with Great Outdoor Provision Company and we'll get North Face. And why don't I try to attempt that? So that was where I kind of could lay out a game plan. I mean, who do you call for a thousand mile run, right? Hey, how do you train for a thousand miler? So that was something, see, that's, that's what I love about my job. Not only do I get to do these races, but I can create. So I created, okay, how am I going to do this thousand mile run? And on top of that, if I'm going to do that, how am, I going, how am I going to stretch that and make it more worthwhile if I'm going to put myself through something like that? And that's where I raise funds for the Mount to Sea Trail. And I think we raised like $50,000 for the trail. So $50,000, it took you 22 days, five hours, three minutes. You surpassed the previous record by some two days. And I read that it also took you 1,935,300 steps from start to finish. And you went through 13 pairs of shoes. That is absolutely amazing, Diane. And this was pretty recently. It is. I did that like, oh, what was it, five years ago, six years ago? And, and truly, I mean, that's my Super Bowl, Shelby, right? I mean, that's, it doesn't get any bigger. It doesn't get any better. I had a person running with me at all times because with my head injury, okay, I get lost on trails, right? I have a hard time yep. holding things visually. And I remember when I sat down with Chuck Millsaps, who owns a great outdoor provision company, and then, you know, my North Face staff that, First of all, I was going to do it solo, and they said, are you crazy? Okay, let's, I'd probably still be in Canada right now, or who knows where. But, you know, every part of that trail, somebody greeted me from North Carolina who was a runner and took me on that section of the trail. So I did it, but it really was, it was a me, but it was a we. <laughs> and, um, yeah, 22 days on our sleep a night and running through a hurricane, six inches of water, running with the tornado off to the side. I mean, we had every element thrown at us. So um, that that's my Super Bowl. That's my everything, you know. We're going to take a quick break to talk about Altessa. When we come back, Diane talks about where her sense of faith comes from and how she's able to conquer such big feats and how you can too. This episode was brought to you by Altessa, a series of outdoor events designed for women who long for a life of discovery. So whether it's committing to a three-day weekend retreat on a mountaintop or an energetic one-day outdoor festival featuring female artists, music, and speakers, Altessa has your outdoor aspirations covered. The great thing about Altessa is women from all walks of life come to connect or even reconnect with themselves and each other in the outdoors. I'll be at some Altessa events this summer, and I'm really stoked to be part of this amazing event series. There's also some great brands involved who make this event possible and are helping lead various activities. So thanks to partners like Subaru of America, Garmin, Osprey, Sea to Summit, Smart Wool, The North Face, Hydro Flask, Pro Bar, Solomon, Maui Gym, Black Diamond, Yakima, Olakai, Roxy, Igloo, and Leatherman. Find more about the REI Altessa events at altessa.com. That's O-U-T-E-S-S-A dot com. Diane, you're such an accomplished athlete and runner. You know, how does one train for a big endurance event? Like if you're just starting out, what are some things you need to know? First of all, you got to like what you do. <laughs> and um, 
do what works best for you. You're going to hear all these different ideas, opinions. And, you know, I had a gal say, okay, I want to run my first 30K or whatever. And, you know, I've always said you have to do your homework, right, in order to be successful. There's no shortcut to being the best or being the best you can be, right? And so, you know, you can always lay out a training program or kind of a way to be able to succeed, but it does take time and it takes motivation. And if I were to tell somebody, you know, get with a partner, get with somebody, get on the trails, go ahead and maybe start a five mile run, then six, and you just kind of keep increasing it. And I think that's what our North Face Endurance Challenge races do, right? Is they give them a flavor of what's it like to run on the trail. Here's how we can set you up to be successful. And so I think the key would be you need to set yourself up to be successful in order to, to continue to kind of challenge yourself. And then truly, really, Shelby, you know, I don't, I never touch a road when I train. I mean, when I'm on the mountains this morning at 4.30 a.m., I have a headlamp and I'm looking at Pikes Peak just starting to glow. You know, it's beautiful. No cars, nothing. And I think that would give people a flavor of really it's more than just the run. It's more about your visual, too. You know, what you see, what you hear, what you feel. Is this normal to, to run at 4.30 a.m. most days? Yes, it is. I'm up. I'm ready wow. to go always. Every morning, 4.30, I'm out the door. A cup of coffee, and then I just train. And that's where I do my thinking and my creating. And, you know, if I'm training for a race, I'll be trying to assimilate that. And then I can come back here and be present for, you know, my new little grandbaby and the kids and family. And And that's the key to being a professional athlete for 16 years, Shelby. You know, I can tell you that being a professional athlete is a lot of strain on family and on my children, you know, when they were small and you've got to keep that balance. You know, you've got to be a wife, a mom, and then a pro athlete because Shelby, you know, if you keep all those things in balance, that's really and truly where you're going to be more successful and um, have less distractions. So any advice to people who have a family and they want to do, you know, sports and endurance challenges, you know, keeping balance. I mean, it, it probably took a lot of work and I'm sure, you know, having a surgery was probably challenging for your kids to watch. Oh, very difficult on my kids. Very, very difficult. You know, here, here mom's having seizures and my kids were, you know, five, seven and nine and they're watching mom have these seizures. And, you know, my role reversed, right, Chill. I mean, my kids were taking care of me. Mm. You know, I remember training our oldest son, is nine on our John Deere tractor just how, you know, what's it like to drive? What's it like to have a pedal, steer? And then that way, when we were in the car, you know, once again, if mom seized, somebody had to know how to turn the car off, pull it over. So they really had to grow up fast, right? Oh, it was devastating on my children, but they grew up fast and they learned to be really compassionate <laughs> um, for people now. And my son was a Marine and he was in Iraq twice and he's home now. But, you know, now that we're on the other side, absolutely. You know, I think if I were to encourage any male or female or if they're in a relationship or they have family, um, you got to work around family because if you don't, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. So, you know, that's why I would always train at 3.30 or 4 in the morning. And that's why I still do that. I mean, I don't even have, I haven't used an alarm in years because that was what I always did when we had children. And keeping the balance is hard, I'm telling you. I mean, being a pro athlete, but I think just for somebody who's just starting and wanting to get into it. Just really be mindful of, you know, being a wife and then a mom and then getting your sport in and just find time. I mean, there's time. You'll find it. And it seems like you're just getting better as you age. Is that true? I mean, how, how is that? I think I get more wisdom, girl. I think wisdom comes with that. Um, mm. You know, I mean, it does, I have a lot right? to learn from in that arena. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, you know, I was running with my girlfriend this morning and she's got four little kids and she's asking me questions. I mean, this is the things that we share on the trail, right? And so yeah. I'm telling her, you know, okay, here's my mistakes. I mean, come on. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes as a wife, as a mom, as a pro athlete. And, you know, when you're vulnerable and you're transparent and you can say, you know, it's okay. I've done that. I've been there. But let me tell you what I've learned from this and let me share this with you. And, um, I think, you know, here I'm 50. I want to continue to grow and learn and challenge myself. And, you know, if I can pass on, pass that on to people and what I've, whether I've learned about my epilepsy, overcoming, being a mom, being a wife, being a pro athlete. I mean, why do you want to hold that in? <laughs> I want to share yeah. that. I want to be able to um, share that. And I think that's the gift that I feel that God has given me. 
And I feel like that's kind of my purpose is to um, be transparent and be vulnerable. Well, we really appreciate you sharing. It's such an incredible story you have, Diane. You know, is there a a lesson in failure that you can share with us? Because I think we talk a lot about success on this show, but I agree you kind of learn equally from your failures as much as success. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's where we all learn, right? I mean, whether you're climbing a mountain or running a race or whatever that is, you know, I mean, we're all we're all human. We're going to fail. There's some races we're not going to finish. And sometimes, you know, it kind of makes you just got to pick your boots up, you know, tighten your belt and just say, mm, I can get through it. Or Shelby, you know, when I'm having seizures for 10 years and nothing was working, I never said, why me? Right. I just kept saying, okay, there's a reason. There's a purpose. Don't give up. Don't give up. Go find another doctor. Find another answer. And so those were the things. Then I started saying, why not me? Right? So I think that was just a lesson that I learned was, um, you know, don't give up. Just pursue. And I think in hindsight as a pro athlete, you know, I took a lot of family time, even though my kids didn't know me any differently. But um, it sure is wonderful now that I'm kind of on the other stage in my career. I'm more, more present and I'm here for them, right? Yeah, that's it's, and you're a grandma. Congra- congratulations. That's yes, incredible. I'm, a, I'm a grandma and I'm just loving it. And he came two months early and this little preemie baby, Cormac Ray Van Deer, and he was born at one pound, 10 ounce, and he had four pounds the other day. And I'm telling you, this little baby's taught me more about life, endurance, perseverance, <laughs> than anything I've endured for 16 years. So um, it's a gift. I feel grateful, Shelby. Where does this gratitude come from? You know, you have this, this amazing attitude, you know, instead of asking why me, which most people would ask, you're saying, why not me? So where does that come from? Like, did you have like a really good mentor? Is it your family? Are you spiritual? Do you read really good books? You know, Well, oh boy. Um, I mean, I've always said with faith, family, and friends, we can achieve all, we can achieve the impossible, right? And I mean, and obviously my faith has always been uh, my rock. Um, I always could turn to God and, you know, just kind of release my fears to Him. So I did always have my faith um, that I leaned into, but, you know, you know what? I'm grateful, Shelby, because when you have 10 years of uncontrollable seizures, You have a life of the unknowns. You're trying to be a wife, a mom. You don't know when your next seizure is going to come. None of the medications are working. I am living in a constant fear of when's when's the beast going to hit me, right? So for 10 Mm -hmm. years, I'm like, okay, I got to be ready. If I took the kid skiing, get that bar down, dying in front of you. Pull it down, man. What if you have a seizure when you're skiing? Oh, that's horrifying. On the chairlift. On the chairlift. You know, we lived on a ranch whenever I'd go horseback riding. Oh, take your feet out of the stirrups. What if you seize? You can't be dragged. You know, I mean, it was always that. And I, you know, I'd be singing in a group and, okay, what if you seize? Where are you going to go stand? So when you have 10 years of the unknowns, the what ifs, and then that changes <laughs> and you get your health back. I mean, how can you not feel grateful? I don't say I can't anymore. You know, I can't, or I'm afraid, or what if? You know, now the way I look at life is I can. I can do it. I can try. I don't have the what ifs. And so I think that's where the gratitude comes from. I mean, I've walked it. I've lived it. I've I've been in the, you know, just a really horrific health situation. And through the brain surgery, I have wealth. I mean, I have my health. And um, yeah, you're grateful. And then when you work with, you know, other families or children, or I speak for other nonprofits or what, I love public speaking. I love talking about my journey, because if I can give them hope and I see what they're enduring, then if my message can come across to them, that's the gratitude I want to, um, you know, show others. How often are you speaking publicly? Oh, I mean, I just spoke for a, a nonprofit here in Denver for kids with debilitating diseases and life-threatening diseases. So that was last month. And I mean, I used to do it more, but I mean, I love doing it. I'd say, I don't know, four times a year, five times a year. It kind of depends on the event, but I love speaking at different events. And I'll tell you an event I love. I need to give a shout out for um, Outessa, um, and that's O-U-T-E-S-S-A. In North Face, we've kind of branded with Outessa, and it's a women's outdoor retreat. 
And I love, I speak at this event. I, you know, speak to the women. I kind of do a little presentation there. And, you know, those are just ways. I love speaking about my story. I always say I have no secrets. I have, you can ask me anything. So there's a platform there that we do without Tessa. And I would encourage any woman or, you know, she wants to get out and try the outdoors and try bicycling, rock climbing, trail running, hiking, cooking, camping. I mean, this event offers everything for any woman at any level. And I know that we're going to be having that August 2nd through the 5th in uh, North Lake Tahoe at Squaw Valley. And then in September, uh, September 13th through the 16th, we have uh, another event there at Waterville Valley in New Hampshire. So see, once again, that gives me an opportunity to speak of my story. So I'm always looking for that niche. Well, I'm excited to meet you in the one at Squaw Valley and give you a hug in person. So Dan, we ask all of our guests these two similar questions. The first is, if you could have a party, which you actually had one yesterday, but if you could have any party for you, who's coming? What food are you having? What music is playing? Okay, who's coming? It will be, I would open that up to, I mean, all family members, everybody who's been a part of my team, whether that be through my surgery, through my um, my counseling, through my recovery, Um you know, I would just open that up for anybody and everybody who has been a, a part of my journey because it did take a team to put me back together, Shelby, you know, and for my kids and my husband to understand now that I'm seizure free, I'm missing a part of a brain. OK, now how do we work with mom with some of those impairments? But those are the people that I would invite in and people have really um, supported me through that and love me through that and let me be me through that. And then um, when I speak, I always end my presentation with ain't no mountain high enough. Because I always feel like, I always feel that there's <laughs> no it. mountain too high, right, Chubb? You know, I just always feel like you can't conquer without passion, belief, you know, determination, and believing in yourself. And so that's the song I always think of: is there's no mountain too high that we cannot conquer. Um, I love so it. So if I have a party, um, will you come to it, Shelby? Will you sing yes, it with me? Yes, of course I'll be there. I'm going to meet you at Otessa. I'll invite you, Shelby. I'll invite you to awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> so the the other thing I really want to know is, you know, what. Do you read by any chance right now still? I do. You know, I'm, I'm reading more now and um, I do. I mean, I used to just like read magazines, like something short and quick because I kind of yeah. like would, would fatigue easily mentally, to be honest. But I do. I'm finding reading more enjoyable and obviously I got some fun things. Maybe you and I regroup in about six months and I'll share something else with you. I've got my back pocket, but... Got it. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what's next? I mean, you always have an idea up your back. Is there any ideas that you can... I know there's probably one brewing. Any you can share that that are coming up? Well, I think brewing is definitely... Um, I want to write a book. I think it's time. And I think I have an incredible journalist I'm teaming up with and um, who knows me, knows my story. And, you know, I've been wanting to do this for 10 years, but I think really and truly, you know what, Shelby, I've done it all. I've set course records. I mean, I've done a thousand mile. I'm still competing. I'm still doing what I love to do, but it's not going to be about how to train. It's going to be how, you know, how do you live? I need to tell stories. I need to tell stories of people who have gotten me to where I am today because those are my angels. And those are the stories I want to share. I cannot wait to read that book. That is going to be an epic book. So, you know, if you could go back in time and tell your younger 15-year-old self one piece of advice, what would you tell her? Just keep being true to who you are. Be true. And I think that's something I've always kept true to myself since I was very little. I mean, I remember the teach, you know, my third grade teacher telling my mom and dad, oh, she can't sit still. She's hyper. She, you know, she's always out playing football with the boys, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? She'll find her gift. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's just, just be true to who you are. Don't try to compare. Don't try to be like somebody else, you know, find your gift. I mean, mine was running, but if, you know, if somebody else has a gift of writing or photography or whatever that is, just, you know, relish that. I mean, embrace that and then take it as far as you can. You know, go big. I like to go big, right? I think going big is the best advice ever. Diane, thank you so much. Where, where can we find more on you until this book comes out? Like if people want to learn more about you, where should I send them? Well, I've never done this, but I've heard that if you Google my name, <laughs> 
you know, I guess that shows up on there, um, the Emmy Award that ESPN won called Time Out of Mind. My Thousand Mile Run clip is on there. Um, I did a thing with Bryant Gumbel on Real Sports. Yeah, we'll put all those up in the show notes. Is there anything else, any advice, you know, you can just leave us with for those who just want to live more wildly? Oh, I, you know, I always say take risk, take the blinders off, you know, go big or go home. I mean, those are kind of things I've always just thought about just why not, you know, why not? Why not try? Because if at least if you try and you fail, it's okay. Because I applaud these people for trying, right? And um, I think something I try to live true to is, here's a saying, Shelby. How about yesterday was history, tomorrow's a mystery. Today is the present. That's why it's called the gift. And so that's why I think everybody should live Love each it. day as a gift. And I say that because I've lived it, I've walked it. Now I can rejoice in it. So um, that's how we should live, Shelby. But I look forward to seeing you at Altessa. Yeah, I'm going to give me you too. the first this is hug. Awesome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and when I have my party, you'll come. You promise. I promise okay. I'll come to your party. And, you know, Dan, if you ever want to learn to surf and you're in San Diego, I offer this up to my guests and I'm dead serious. And I've actually had a guest take me up on it recently, but I'll oh. take you surfing. I was just out in San Diego with my husband on a business trip. So I'm going to take you up on that, girlfriend. Whew. Thank you to Diane for sharing your story. Thank you to Nick for driving to her house and recording this episode on her side. Thank you to the North Face for sponsoring Diane and so many epic athletes we've interviewed. We've had on Dean Karnazes and even Brogan Graham of the November Project. Listen to them. And like the North Face says, never stop exploring. Okay, so go to Altessa. I'll be there. Diane will be there. You can also check out the REI Coronado Stand-Up Paddle Campout in San Diego, June 9th and 10th. I'll be there too. We'll have links in the show notes with movies featuring Diane and more on her. Diane is a true force of nature. I can't wait for that book to come out. So Diane, hurry up and write it. When you're running and you're tired today, think of Diane and then just keep going. I'd love it if you could hit subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening Write reviews, tell your friends, you can shop at REI, and don't forget, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.